from his studios in New York. It's time for Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets life. Here's your host, Dan Tortora. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. Proud to be here with you every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You are watching us on Facebook Live on Facebook.com backslash LiveNowDT, and you're listening on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. DT, we just celebrated our seven-year anniversary of Dan Tortora Broadcast Media, and we thank you so much for listening and watching when it comes to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, our entertainment show, Super Powered Pop, and of course, Dan on Disney, our Disney show, as well as coming out to our live events with the community, whether it be Liverpool Athletics or CNS or West Genesee or Fantasy Football Leagues, as well as trivia that we have every Tuesday at Press Room on at 7 p.m. and then Wednesday at Dominic's Restaurant every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. So however you link to the show, thank you so much for being a part of it. You can find us on Facebook at Wake Up Call DT, Twitter at Call DT, and Instagram at Wake Up Call underscore DT. And now it is my honor, my pleasure, always to speak with Syracuse football alumni. We have had uh, right around 100 different players grace the stage here, former players, and constantly talking to current and upcoming players in recruitment as well. So it is it is uh, such an honor and a privilege to speak with so many different voices that have donned the orange and blue at Syracuse. And the next one up is cornerback alum Will Hunter, who is here with us today in our official week to kickoff. We've celebrated Syracuse with Rob Carpenter, Danny Conley, as well as Darius Kelly, Eric Kroom, Cole Murphy, Zach Mahoney, and Rob Long this week alone. And now we have Will Hunter to round out the week to speak on Syracuse in the 2019 season, his time at Syracuse, and so much more. So with that being said, let's bring him in. Will, how are we doing today? I'm doing good, thank you. And, and Will, just kind of first and foremost for you, uh, just what you could say about your history and, and your time at Syracuse, Maybe some of the uh, the fondest memories that you've had. Oh man! Um, well, my my freshman year, actually, you have a great memory there. Um, I'm sitting at my locker after practice, and uh, I'm I'm young, so I don't really know any better. You know, I got my locker door way open, and it's in front of one of the other players' locker. And uh, Stan Gibbs, uh, the former linebacker here, he was uh, my neighbor. And McNabb had to be about two, uh, Don McNabb had to be about two lockers over. So Stan had a bad practice. <laughs> so instead of, uh, you know, just gathering himself, he decided he wanted to take it out on me. And uh, so he said, uh, if you don't move your ass, uh, I'm going to punch you in your mouth or something to that effect. <laughs> McNabb turned around and said, man, don't worry about that boy. He just mad he had a bad practice. <laughs> so, so I'm fresh. I don't know what's going on. He want to fight because my locker door is covering his locker up. So I'm like, man, get out of here. But that was pretty cool. Um, and then, man, just, you know, the, the, the next thing that really comes to mind is uh, my, you know, playing against um, Kentucky. Uh, in one of our, in a Music City Bowl um, as a as a red shirt freshman, and uh, one of the greatest feelings and experiences I've ever had. And and for you to you know to have that experience and and to have that connection, just what that you know uh, what that meant to you to play in the Music City Bowl, and you know I mean bowl games have been in recent history you know hard to come by for Syracuse and, and Dino Babers obviously trying to change that climate and doing a tremendous job of, of changing that climate just to know that you are a part of that and a part of a part of bowl season and a part of the extended season just what that means to you looking back in time knowing that Syracuse has had some has fallen on some kind of hard times recently in in, in a in kind of uh, trying to get back to those moments and back to those 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 times of of grace and those times of positivity just what it means to you to be a part of that history 
Um, it, it means a lot. I mean, because you always have that to look back on uh, and reflect on. Even when you uh, come across some players that you've played with um, and you hadn't seen them in years. I mean, and a lot of times the first thing that uh, we want to talk about is what we did at bowl games. Not necessarily what we did in individual games, um, but, you know, the fun that you have when you go to experience those things. It, it, it just means a lot, and it's something that you get to carry around uh, for the rest of your life. Um, and then, as you mentioned, there was a, a, a huge stretch um, sort of when we left where it was looking kind of iffy if we were ever going to get back to some great football. Um, and thank God we got a good coach and a good staff up there now and it's you know, uh, bringing us back to prominence. Uh, but uh, you, you miss it. And, you know, you just, and, and when you end it, you don't understand how much it means to you. But when you get to step away, like I said, you get to reflect on it, you know, for, for a number of years uh, after you're done. Speaking here with Will Hunter, a cornerback alum of Syracuse football history. You got a picture here that, that I utilized in in promotion of, of our conversation where you're picking off the ball and you got somebody laying under you here. Do you remember this moment? I know I know it's up on your Facebook and whatnot, but uh, you know, are, are these moments that kind of stay fresh in your mind? Do you when you look back at a picture, do you remember, you know, that play or that moment specifically? Uh, yes, I actually do remember that play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh man, it's 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 I think they actually called pass interference on that play right there. Um, where I'm picking the ball off. Uh, and it kind of it kind of sucks because in my mind, you know, I was looking back for the ball. Although I made some body contact with him, I didn't use my hands to push him out of the way. Yeah. My head was up at you know facing the ball or, or tracking the ball. He and I kind of collisioned. Um, I picked it off. He fell to the floor. I look around and there's a flag on the ground. And uh, it, it was actually that gang there. I don't think they. You know, I don't want to blame the refs or whatever, but I don't think they wanted us to win. We were down in BYU, and, uh, you know, we had, it just felt like we had a 13th man or 12th man working against us while we were out there. And so, I mean, you, but and, and the thing is, like, I ask you about that. I ask you about that picture with a BYU player on the ground, and you remembered all of that. You remembered the refs. And I think it's fair to say that nobody forgets the officials when when the game feels like it's going one way and, and, and not being called fair. We, we never seem to forget. If you ask any Syracuse fan ever in the history of anything, remember that game when you played Georgetown, and the first thing, oh, I remember that official. I remember his name. I remember what he said. Four minutes and 13 seconds left in the game. We don't forget, you know. We're we're a ruthless bunch, Will. Are we not? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's crazy. The, that, the crazy part about it is um, when I went into the league, um, he actually got me for a couple more penalties. That same referee. <laughs> I'm like, yo, man, what is this? <laughs> this dude got something against me, man. I don't understand it. What's going on? But um, ever since that, you know, that penalty there, I just remembered that referee and. Um, you know, I'm not going to call out his name or anything like that, but he's in the NFL now, and he's been doing this for a very long time. Um, I'm sure if he saw me walking down the street, he'll probably throw another penalty on me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. He sees you in the grocery store. You go and you go and pick up, like, a can of tuna, and he throws that flag and blows that whistle. I mean, it, I mean, it, that, you know, that would be an awesome, pretty awesome co- – <laughs> You what you say? <laughs> I said, yeah, you know, penalize me for picking up the wrong can. Absolutely, you know, I I think that this would be a good commercial. I think we need to call him and we need to make this happen. Yeah, let's do it. And, and we'll call it hunting Will Hunter. I think it'd be good. I like, it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So you, you let's before we get into the 2019 Syracuse football squad, uh, let, let's let's discuss your time in the NFL. You and I talked about it a little bit off the air, but to make it to the NFL is is such a difficult thing to do. To I think if you make it to the NFL and you play a game, you know you've achieved something that so few people do. And I always try to bring it into perspective. I, I tell people there's 70,000 fans in a stadium. There's 22 players on a field at any given time. That to me, it is a. It, I mean, that should be a huge sign of just how difficult 
it is to get out there and, and you had the chance to do so. So for people that know, people that don't, just share with everybody, you know, where you played and, and kind of, you know, inside and outside of the NFL and the experience you had, because I love kind of reliving the story and, and letting the people know kind of what your what your trail was, because any moment in professional athletics is is such a uh, difficult thing to accomplish. So first and foremost, congratulations. And second of all, we'd love to hear your story. Um, well, yeah, so uh, I came out of SU in 2002. Um, I went undrafted. Um, uh, so, but, you know, during the draft, I got a couple calls saying, hey, we're about to draft you. No, you know, nobody pulled the trigger. Okay, that's fine. You know, I'm not going to give up on my dream. So um, I had a, a choice between uh, Atlanta, Philly, and, uh, well, Philly came in much later after I had already made my decision, but Atlanta and, and the Jets. And uh, I chose the Jets because uh, two reasons. One, Atlanta had just drafted a corner in the first round. Um, Brian Scott, um, they had just drafted that guy. Um, so in my mind, I'm thinking, why would I go and compete with someone you just drafted in the first round? Um, you know, I've heard it, and it was unfortunate that I didn't have a great circle that knew about the ins and outs of the league. Uh, you know, my agent at the time, uh, wasn't the most, uh, thorough guy in, in, in research. Um, but long no, story so short, so I choose the... The, the Jets because they didn't draft anybody. They had some older players out there. So I chose the Jets um, because I knew I could go there and compete and, and possibly win a job. And uh, I'm actually out there and uh, all summer long, even you know at the start of camp, uh, I was giving out work. Um, it was looking so good. I had moved up the depth, depth chart to second team. Um, and uh, boom, I, I sprained my ankle. And not going to blame anyone for it. Uh, I wasn't able to make it back onto the field um, for a few weeks. And as a rookie, undrafted free agent, if you're not able to put your work on film, regardless of how how well you were doing uh, prior to, it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, so when I was able to come back, uh, they had already, you know, it appeared they had already made their decision. And what they did was they allowed me to play in one of the games. Um, and this was the third preseason game. Um, so they allowed me to play in the game, get some film out there, and then uh, release me. Um, but the second reason that I went there was uh, my coach, my high school coach, uh, was familiar with Ted Cottrell, um, who's from my hometown. Um so, you know, they got to talking or whatever, and that was kind of a way in. Um, and thank God that I did go out to the Jets, because if I hadn't, um, you know, I don't know where I would have been, because Ted ended up bringing me back out to Minnesota. So I leave uh, I leave the Jets. Uh, you know, like I said, I got cut. Um, kind of down on myself. Um, I knew that, you know, if I didn't hurt myself, I'm probably starting for those guys, or if I'm not starting, I'm in the rotation. Um, so I leave there, uh, and then, you know, a whole, pretty much a whole year, nobody touches me. So I'm thinking, you know, my career may be over before it even had a chance to get started. And, uh, the next year, NFL Europe called, uh, which is still kind of the NFL world. Not now, they don't have this program anymore, but they, what they do is they bring you in, you play down in Tampa, uh, and then they send you over to... Uh, Europe to play, you know, some football. Um, and while in Europe, I was with the Cologne Centurions, and man, it was a ball. And uh, I kind of destroyed the league over there. Ended up making first team all NFL Europe as a corner, um, and just played really well. I mean, it was to the point where you know the, the, the Revis Island effect. I had that over there in NFL Europe. You couldn't throw to my side without the ball. Uh, being incomplete or picked off. Um, so I come back from Europe, and uh, Tampa picks me up right away. And uh, and I'm doing my thing in Tampa as well. I get there. Uh, I'm, I'm just in the best shape of my life. I'm still squatting 
like 400 something pounds. Uh, I'm still benching 300 and something pounds. Uh, and mind you, I'm only 190 pounds at the time. And uh, I make it all the way through to the last day. And uh, normally, they, if they're going to release you, they'll release you by noon. Um, so I'm I'm in a room nervous because I don't know what's going to happen. And uh, and I'm thinking it's like five o'clock. I'm like, oh man, I'm good. I'm sure they've done all their releases and stuff like that by now. Uh, probably, you know, sooner no sooner I say that, you know, I get a knock on the door. Hey, we need you to come down. Uh, and this is with uh, Coach Mike Tomlin. Uh, who was the position coach there at the time, and John Gruden and those guys. And uh, Tomlin actually called me into the office, and he sat me down, and he said, listen, you know, we really, really wanted to keep you here, um, but we're only allowed so many spots. And the guy that they chose to keep was the guy that they had the year before. And I can't be upset with that. I mean, that, that kind of makes sense. He was already in the system. Um I would imagine that we were kind of similar players in, in, in the way we played, but he got denied because of, you know, he was there the year before. Um, and good for him. Uh, so I leave, I leave Tampa the very last day of training camp. And uh, the, so maybe two weeks or so go by, and the Giants bring me in for a workout. Um, they fly me in. Um, I work out for them. They fly me home, and no sooner did my plane land, I got a call, uh, and they said, "Hey, we need you to turn get, turn back around, get on the next flight to come back out here." So they signed me that same day, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, and at this point, you know, I'm on the practice squad. Uh, um, so there, I'm doing my thing. Eli's the quarterback. Uh, get a get an opportunity to play with my ex teammate Dave Tyree. Um, so that was an experience as well. Uh, get to see you know Michael Strahan and those guys up close and in person. And as a young fella, you 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 you're kind of in awe, uh, but at the same time you understand that you have a job to do. And uh, I gave I gave the Giants my all. I gave them everything that I had, and uh, unfortunately they you know. They, they brought me out because someone got hurt. So, you know, the guy comes back, you know, it's business. And still young, still not understanding it, still don't have a circle necessarily that can explain these things to you and help you understand it. Um, but, you know, that that's part of it. And I, you know, one of the things that I hope the NFL has done is been able to put our young uh, upcoming players in a situation where they have that education because what you'll find quickly is that it's a business and it's not personal. It's not that uh, these coaches or these teams don't believe that you are a good player or any of that kind of stuff. Um, it's just it's business and it comes down to numbers. Uh, so I'm out there for about a month and I get released and uh, I'm not even sure it's been a week when I got the call to come out to Minnesota. And guess who's on the other end making that call? Uh, Ted Cottrell. Um, so, you know, that relationship that I built with Ted back in 2004, and mind you, this is 2005 now, um, mind you, that relationship that I built with Ted Cottrell was positive, and I put some good stuff on film. So he was able to pull some strings and get me an opportunity to come out to Minnesota. And I'm thinking when I get there that it's going to be a tryout similar to, you know, all the other teams I had to to work out for. And it wasn't. Terry Cottrell brought me in, put me in pads, and, and said, hey, we got practice. <laughs> <laughs> so I get, as soon as I get off the plane, I'm right in practice. And um, my very first day there, uh, Randy Moss is trying to run an out route. Uh, Dante Culpepper is the quarterback. He's throwing it. And he go well, young and hungry and trying to prove a point, I intercept the ball. <laughs> so I'm fresh off the plane. I intercept the ball. Um, and, I mean, it, it, it just erupted in there. And, you know, from that play and, you know, a few other after it, man, I was just, I came 
came in, I brought a whole new energy to the practice. And uh, and that was the first thing Mike Tice said to me, because uh, he was the head coach at the time. It was like, can you keep that energy up all the time? I was like, man, listen, you ain't seen nothing yet. So I kind of come in and try to change the culture of the practice squad um, on my very first day. Um you know, and it was interesting uh, that in the rest of that week, the, even the the film guys who are high up in the air filming the practices was screaming out my name. Yeah, well, let's go. So, I mean, it was just it was just fantastic. So, um, that opportunity, um, you know, had it not been for Ted Cottrell, I don't know where I would be. But he gave me the opportunity, and you know, I I was able to capitalize on it. I was able to go out there and, and play some football the way I came for playing football. Um, and the spotlight immediately went on me. Um, and it wasn't long before I was on the actual travel team. Um, cause obviously when you, when you first start out, not when you first start out, but typically when you are a undrafted free agent, um, you don't just come out and get shot at the, the 53 man roster. I was able to get that shot on that roster. Um, and I was able to capitalize on it. So that was my time out in Minnesota, man. I went from, you know, that immediately went from practice squad to active squad and uh, had a great time out there, met some great people. I was able to travel the world through sports and, and football. Um, but, uh, again, man, one of the things I want young, upcoming athletes to understand is nobody's going to give you anything, um, whether you're drafted or undrafted. Um you got to work for it because there's somebody who's right behind you trying to take your opportunity um, and, and prove you prove to the coaches that they can play better than you. Um, and you have to be, uh, you have to have good character. And I think that's what helped me out as well. Um, I treated everyone in the building from the janitor all the way up to the owner with the same respect. Um, please, thank you. Hold the doors for people. When there's opportunities for community service, I was always volunteering my time. Um, I was fully vested. And if you're going to take this opportunity to play at that level, and if you're undrafted, I mean, you really have to be fully vested into you know, the program, the city, and the community, um, because those things matter as well. That all coming from Will Hunter. Will Hunter speaking with us here this morning on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora in our official week to kick off. Syracuse cornerback alum and a former professional player as well. Will, thank you. I mean, in all honesty, to, to, to tell us that story and, and the real life story of, of being, you know, somebody who wants to, to make it in the sport of football. And, and telling people, listen, somebody's going to come for your job, you know, somebody, you know, anything can happen. And like you said, you learned that it was a business because you shifted to so many places. You were all over the world. You think that you're getting this. You, you get on a flight. You go home. You land. They say get back on the plane. Come back here. You go back there. You think you got a job. You're on the practice squad. And then before you know it, you're off that team. And then it's the relationships that you make like you said, to come all full circle and have a phone call from somebody that you had met a year ago, say, we want you out here, and then you're in pads immediately and you're going up against Randy Moss and, you know, you're stopping a place. So, you know, for you, I, I just, I mean, it's your story, but at the same time, it's such a perfect description of life because they always say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And I think there's a lot of people out there now who say, I want to be this. I'm going to sit on my couch and wait for it to happen. And that's not how life happens. If you want it, you got to go get it. You got to grab it by the horns and you got to hold on for dear life. And so, I mean, I, I'm sure that you had adversity. I'm sure that you had strife. I'm sure that, you know, you had you had some tough times going through everything that you just described. But at the same time, it's such a great story to tell to the world because people need to know that it's not easy to follow your dreams. It's just worth it. So, you know, Will, for, for you, uh, I mean, there's so many things that you said, but you got you got to go around the world, you got to travel, you talked about NFL Europe, and, and like you said, you had a lot of fun there, killed it over there in, in NFL Europe, but uh, it, it doesn't exist anymore, and, you know, we have the NFL, we have the CFL, the AFL, the AAF was just one season, 
Uh, the XFL is coming back. The American Flag Football League, the AFFL, is, is here. Pacific Pro Football, the PPF, the Freedom Football League, the FFL, uh, Indoor Football League, the IFL, the Spring League, and then uh, there used to be the UFL, which I covered, where I got to be down with the Florida Tuskers in Orlando that played at Camping World State. What What is Camping World Stadium now, ironically, where Syracuse just was. So my life kind of came full circle with that, knowing that uh, that used to be the old Citrus Bowl, and that's where the Florida Tuskers played. It's how I met Dominique Rhodes, who won a Super Bowl with Peyton Manning. It's how I met uh, Brooks Bollinger and Avion Kaysen, so many different guys that were there, Joe Theismann, uh, Doug Flutie, as well as uh, Jay Gruden and John Gruden. And then we have the USFL, which used to exist, the United States Football League, and, and of course, NFL Europe, which was you know around from 91 to 92 and then 95 to 2007 and, uh, and left us 12 years ago and had as many as 10 teams. So just you know, for you to know that there, there's so much out there and things have come and gone, you've gotten to experience it. So what would you say to an aspiring football player about the opportunities that are out there and then secondarily do you miss NFL Europe do you kind of because you had such a great experience do you it is that kind of you know sadden you a little bit that we don't have it here um I don't necessarily miss it uh you know not NFL Europe I miss football and tackle football in general but not necessarily specifically NFL Europe um it was a great experience um but not something that uh you know, although I did really well, not something I would have had like to repeat. Um, it, it is unfortunate that it's no longer an option for people um, because it is such a great experience. I mean, you're talking about a kid from inner city, um, Chester, uh, a, a suburb of Philly, who, you know, all I knew at the time was Chester. So to get that experience is tremendous. Not too many people, and if you look at you know, the NFL and the way it's constructed, a lot of people come from similar backgrounds where there's, you know, not much going on. So we don't necessarily know anything outside of that. So to get an experience like that, um, you know, it's huge, it's tremendous, and, you know, it it transforms you and turns you into a different person. And now we don't have that opportunity for a lot of, you know, people that are similar in my situation. So it's it's sad in that regard. what I would tell, you know, players is just never give up, man. Like you said, there, there are so many opportunities out there now um, to play at a high level. Um, and if you enjoy the sport of football, don't do it for the money. Um, because if you're doing it for the money, you'll get eaten up. Uh, you won't last very long. Um, because what you'll find is, although uh, the contract looks good, you have people you have to pay and you have to support yourself. And... Uh, and I'm sure you want to want to support some family members, to say the least. Uh, but it's you know just never give up on your dream. If your dream is to make the NFL, there are pretty many many avenues to take. Um, never give up. And the way social media is constructed now, everybody's got eyes on everything. So if you're good and you're going to stand out, uh, be a stand out, be a positive person. Uh, again, say please and thank you. Get involved in your community so that when an NFL team do decide to call and ask about you, uh, your coach or the people that know you uh, only can say good things about you. Uh, You know, you got to practice hard. Obviously, when you're in practice, um, one of the sayings I use for my youth programs is, you know, make practice harder than the game. If you practice harder, uh, you know, there's not going to be a situation that come up in the game where you weren't familiar with it already. And that would, that's what separate the good teams from the bad teams. And, you know, that all come in here from Will Hunter, advice to everybody out there. And, and Will, obviously, you know, I appreciate that. And, you know, I hope the kids listen to the fact that, and you just said it, you don't chase the money. And Dominique Rhodes, I brought this up this week on the show when I was covering the UFL and Dominique was playing there. You know, I, I had come to a crossroads and I was very frustrated with things that were going on and and he looked at me and he said he said I'm going to tell you something that was said to me and I've used it ever since he said if you chase the money you'll chase it forever but if you chase your passion and your dreams 
the money will chase after you and eventually catch up to you. And it sounds like you just kind of said the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man, that sounds like a smart man there. And, and you had the experience uh, and have had the, you know, opportunity lately, as we were talking off the air, of, of helping, you know, mold young minds and to help them through the sports world. And <clears throat> Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, our tagline here forever, has been where sports meets life, which is an easy way of saying that I use the world of sports as kind of my car to teach about life, you know, to bring people together to make this a close-knit, loving heartfelt, uh, appreciative community where we can help each other out and not just help ourselves. You embody where sports meets life all the time because you're molding young minds in the sport of basketball and in the sport of football. What got you into it and, you know, just what you want to share about it, maybe how people get involved, because there are so many pictures on your social media, on your Facebook of these kids and, and different coaches and maybe guest speakers and obviously yourself so share with everybody what you're doing and and how you're truly embodying where sports meets life in the community. Uh, so my programs um, are called, uh, well, the business itself is a not-for-profit. Um, it's called Will Hone Your Skills, uh, WISE for short, that's W-H-Y-S. Um, you, if you're on Facebook, if you search at WISE Programs, um, you will you know, find our information. If you're on Instagram, we're on Instagram as, again, same thing, at Wise Programs. Um, you'll see uh, many of our programs. Our website is uh, wiseprograms.com. Um, so if you wanted some more information on what we do, you can find it there as well. Um, so what we do is we, we teach sports um, to youth, um, co-ed, obviously. Uh, if your child is interested uh, in sports, um, you know, have them, have them come out and sign up. We used, um, the ages are 4 through 12. Um, we got, we're recently got into some adult programs where we have adult basketball. Um, we had women's flag football league. Um, we, we tried a women's basketball league as well. Currently we have a, an eighth grade U basketball, co-ed basketball league. We have a sixth grade U, um, co-ed basketball league getting set to start in mid-September. Uh, we have a fourth grade basketball league, um, and these are our competitive programs that I speak up right now, um, where, you know, we don't do our typical program, and I'll explain our typical program here in a second. So we have a fourth grade U league um, that'll be wrapping up, and we'll be starting another in October. Um, and these are basketball. Um, so we don't currently have any football uh, flag football, because that's what we do. We don't currently have any flag football competitive leagues right now. So our standard programs um, and football and basketball, what we do is we have kids sign up from the ages of 4 through 12, and each week we'll, the, the age group will meet for an hour. Uh, so our 4 through 6-year-olds will meet from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., depending on how many kids we have registered, they can be from 9 to 11. Um, and each team, we break them up into teams, and each team will meet for one hour. We teach for 30 minutes the game, um, and with, when we're teaching the game or teaching a specific skill, we also have what is called sportsmanship values. Um, and one of the things we try to instill in our kids that do our program is the character part, because that's important, and that's what our sportsmanship values try to try to uh, teach, you have to have the, the good character in order to be a good player, um, so to speak. So we meet for 30 minutes in practice, then we allow the kids to play a game for 30 minutes. So, But even in this skill trainer program, and that's what we call it, we call that our skill trainers, um, we'll stop the game because it's not an actual game, it's semi-competitive. We'll stop the game and allow those players to uh, – try to see what we're talking about. So if somebody double dribbled and they continue to double dribble, we'll stop the game uh, to explain to them what they're doing wrong. Um, and it's not to single them out because we want all of our players to stop and pay attention. Um, and one of the things they have to understand is that if I'm speaking to just him, I'm not speaking to just him. I'm talking to the entire group um, so that we can all learn from it. So that's what we do uh, for our standard programs. Again, it's called Will Hone Your Skills. Um, more information can be found on my website. You can also email me at wiseprograms.com. I'm um, sorry, 
Programs at gmail.com um, if you want to email me to get more information. Um, but I got into it um, because I always wanted to be a teacher. Um, some of the people who are influential in my life um, are teachers. My high school coach, um, my high school football coach, and my middle school basketball coach um, are like fathers to me to this day. Um, yeah. There were times in high school where I wanted to give up sports because I had some life issues that I wanted to deal with. Um, and these two men, you know, kind of took a hold and, and said, you know, uh, you, you can't. And one of the things they instilled on me is, you know, they said they don't want anything from me, but they want me to pay it forward. So since that day, uh, or since those times, all I wanted to do was be able to do the same thing and pay it forward to, to the youth in our community. Um, my, undergrad degree is in education. I wanted to be a phys ed teacher. Um, and, you know, life has its twists and turns, so I didn't end up doing that. Um, but I came across this opportunity where I could run a not-for-profit and still teach um, sports. Um, and that's my passion. It's always something, like I said, it's always something that I want to do ever since those guys took a hold of me. Um, and now I have the opportunity to give back and you know, it's fairly affordable programs, um, and we always do our best to ensure that um, people from every community are able to, you know, participate in our programs. And speaking here with Will Hunter, uh, once again, you can go to the website, uh, wise, uh, whysprograms.com. That's whysprograms.com. I saw that you're doing something at the fair uh, flag football at the fair, end of summer fun. It says uh, Monday, September 2nd, obviously Labor Day from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. at at the uh, fair. Just what you can say about this, uh, something exciting for the kids, a little bit of flag football there. And, and, you know, I see that you have tournament groups with 8U, 10U, 12U, 15U, and 18 and older out of high school, uh, double elimination or single elimination as well. Just what you could say about that. I mean, the fair is one of the biggest things we do here in central and upstate New York, and you have something with wise programs that's going to be there. Yeah. Um, well, they, uh, this is a huge opportunity for us um, because the number of people that visit the fair, um, I understand it's the last day, um, but I still believe, um, and based on every time I watch the news, they still talk about people coming out in record numbers. So it's an opportunity to showcase our program to uh, a number of people that not don't necessarily live in the area, but they're just visiting, and a number of people that do live here. So it's going to be a huge opportunity for us. Um, we're we're going to be there, like you said, from ten to ten to about seven. And uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to kind of run our programs. I'm going to have my friend and myself there, Chris Davis. We're going to be there signing autographs from 10 to 12. Um, and then we're going to go in, into the actual game. Um, so, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, someone is at my door. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're okay. Yeah. We'll let him take care of that now for a second here and, and bring Will right back on. <laughs> Are we back? Or... Yeah, 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 you're good. Okay, I apologize about that. Uh, someone's knocking and, and I'm still home. Um, yeah, so, you know, we're going to have some games. We're going to have uh, some tournament-style games. We're going to do single elimination. Um, if individuals still want to sign up, they can do so on the website or they can sign up the day of to play in the game. Um, this one isn't, this tournament isn't uh, to the point where it's going to be super competitive in, in that um, we're still going to allow players or participants to walk up to the, the facility and sign their kid up if that's something they want to do. Um, you know, maybe next year it'll be a little more strict, but this year we're kind of opening it up to everybody. So we'll be at the Expo Center. Uh, from 10 to 12 or from 10 to, to 7 if you want to sign your kids up uh, for our programs outside of the fair you can do so if you want to sign your kid up at the fair to play in the tournament there um, please feel free to do so um, we're not going to turn anyone away if they want to participate we'll do our best to get them into the game and it's you know obviously awesome and an awesome experience in the last day of the fair and, and right before kids get back to school 
and you know being at the expo center which is so beautiful and uh, such an amazing addition to our community is is great so you know all of the thing all signs point to yes so if you'd like to do that bring your family over and just come check it out as well will hone your skills w h y s it's w h y s programs.com and you can come enjoy some flag football and bring your children there as well uh, bring the youth all the way up to 18 and older to the expo center this monday september 2nd labor day at the fair from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. and get involved in it. And you can sign up at the fair while you're there. And, of course, uh, like Will said, he'll be signing autographs to start off the the uh, day at 10 a.m. inside of the Expo Center as well. Uh, Will, before I let you go, 2019, uh, the, the season is here. It's hard to believe. I feel like it was yesterday that I was in Orlando for the Camping World Bowl. But, you, you know, we're, we're at the 2019 season. Everybody's zero in zero Thoughts on the team this year? You know what? A lot of people are saying eight wins, ten wins. You know, somewhere around that. Uh, they start the season at Liberty and at Maryland. They're home against Clemson, Western Michigan, and Holy Cross. They're at NC State, home against Pitt, at Florida State, home against BC, at Duke, at Louisville, and home against Wake Forest. What are your thoughts on the record for Syracuse this year? Um, I think. I think we are um, we have a great opportunity this season to go out and show the world that you know everything is coming together. Yeah. Uh, I believe you know at minimum ten wins. Um, you know I, the only team that I can see us uh, losing to just based off of you know preseason and you know everyone's been healthy. Um, and I don't necessarily see you, even see us losing to them because we have them in the dome, and that's Clemson. Clemson is a very good football team, but they got to come to us this year. So they're going to have their hands full. I think if we play with the same energy and intensity we've played with for the last few years, um, we can come out on top in that game. Um, but I don't see anybody else. If we play the way Syracuse is capable of playing, we're going to be successful, um, and we're going to have a great year. Uh, we have a great coach. Um, the speed in the dome is is to our advantage. Um, not many people come into the dome to understand that there's there, that's some heat in there. And when you're playing um, and you're in that heat, you don't realize it until you know we're jumping down your throat. So I believe we're going to be very very successful. I predict a, a bowl game. I even I believe we can make it to the college football playoffs. Um, if we can get past this Clemson team, um, cause the rest of them, uh, are nowhere near as good as the Clemson. And we see that not only is this, this Clemson game, a big time game, but the last time Clemson came into the carrier dome, <clears throat> they were sent out with a loss. They don't lose that much. The last time they came in, they were a reigning national champion. This time they come in, they're a reigning national champion. Last time they came in, they had a loss. The only two teams to beat them in like a two-year span were Alabama and Syracuse. And here we go again as Syracuse has him in the Dome as we speak with Will Hunter, Syracuse football alum, inside of the Charney's Menswear and Tuxedo Studios on 3150 Erie Boulevard East in Syracuse, New York. So uh, a bunch of different final pieces here as we wrap things up, Will. One of them being, I've made the statement to College Game Day that you really don't have a choice. The only games that are going on in Week 3 on September 14th are Florida and Kentucky, Iowa, Iowa State, Pittsburgh and Penn State, and Syracuse and Clemson of the notables. I don't think there's any other game that you can really circle and say, okay, this is where game day needs to be. It, to you, should it be a done deal? I mean, are you kind of sitting at game day going, uh, yeah, where else are you going to go that you're going to find you know, this type of action? To me, it's it's not because I was born and raised in Syracuse. It's It's the truth. I think everybody wants to see Clemson and Syracuse because – I'm sure a lot of people missed it two years ago. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I don't see why they wouldn't be here, um, uh, you know, because that game is going to be is going to be special. We're going to have, um, you know, like I said, they're going to still be ranked high. Um, we're still going to be ranked. Um, so who would you rather see a team that, um, uh, like you mentioned, uh, one of the few teams that's beaten them over the last few years, uh, why wouldn't you want to see them uh, take another L? 
<laughs> so I mean, and and you see this, and you 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 see the fact that it's a sellout. You know, for single game tickets have been sold out there. If you want to buy a ticket, if somebody's reselling it or whatnot, somewhere around ninety dollars, close to a hundred dollars. I remember going to Tallahassee and to the Florida State Florida game, and the tickets were eighty one dollars to sit at the top of the stadium to see Syracuse tickets be the price of Florida state tickets is uh, such a, su- I mean, for me, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see something like that. Cause I didn't know if, and when that would ever happen where Florida state's tickets and Syracuse's tickets for football would be on the same line. But not only with that, will there's 9,000 at least new season ticket holders this is a number that defeated a record of, I think, 83,070 or something like that in the past. Thoughts on the fact that almost 10,000 new season ticket holders are, are inside the Carrier Dome. I mean, or the, the lockdown drag out last year, every home game that Syracuse had, they won. They did defend the Dome. They defended ho- <laughs> their home field. And now here they come in, coming off a 10-3 and season, a bowl game being ranked in the preseason in the AP and the coaches poll, being picked to finish second behind Clemson in the Atlantic division by the ACC media, including myself. Uh, Just uh, your thoughts on the fact that the fans are, they're there. I mean, they're finally, I think if there was 500 more season tickets sold, I would have, I would have been happy to see that, but 9,000, just what your thoughts are as an alum to hear something like that. Um, I'm I'm super excited that our fans have decided to come back out and watch. Um, I think uh, you know one of the things that make it hard for a program when you're trying to rebuild your program is that the fan support isn't there. Because you have to remember, uh, even though we're not or we weren't winning many games, we still had recruits that we were trying to bring in. And if a recruit comes to a, a game and you're your, your stadium only has, you know, 8,000 people in it. However many people end up showing to a game. Yeah. If the seats are empty, that recruit's not coming because they want to play in front of, uh, you know, a number of people. Uh, they want the stands to be packed. So it's, it's hard to, to watch when those situations happen. Um, you know, but as fans, I understand their point of view. You know, they want to come and they want to be entertained. Um, so it's up to the coaches to do whatever they can. But now that we're back to prominence, it's exciting. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing our dome packed, and it, it makes a huge difference. I've played in many of domes, including the NFL, and when our dome is packed to capacity, it is one of the loudest stadiums I've ever played in. And if we bring that same energy night in and night out, uh, it's going to be hard for football teams to come in here and beat us and be competitive. Yeah, you know, and, and I, what I think is amazing about it, you just said it. I mean, I've been saying it forever. If a recruit goes to Notre Dame and there's 100,000 people there, and the recruit goes to Penn State and there's 110,000 people there, and they go to Florida State and there's 89,000, 91,000 people there, and they come to Syracuse and people are leaving in the third quarter to get to Denny's on time, that is going to affect recruiting. And if they see you leave in the third quarter, I mean, I've had players tell me, that while they were playing the game on the field, they watched the fans leave while they were there in the game, on the fields, in the moment. And, you know, you can't do that. I mean, I know people are going to do what they want to do. They bought the tickets, and they say, you know, I got a right to do what I want to do. But if I have a not-so-great dinner, I don't leave in the middle of my steak. If I pay for a movie, and it's an hour in... I'm not getting my money back. I'm going to stay through the movie. If I'm on a ride that I think is an okay ride, I can't jump off the roller coaster while I'm on it. So, you know, for me, I would love to just see fans stay on it and, you know, stay on this roller coaster. There's ups and downs. There's ebb and flow to everything in life. And, you know, I would just, I would love for them to truly uh, be there. And it's good to see that there's more than 9,000 new season ticket, hol- season ticket holders, and I hope they stick around. Final piece here, biggest question mark and biggest positive, Will, of this team this season? Um, I would say the question mark, unfortunately, is the quarterback. Um, Although he got some experience playing last year, he wasn't the full-time starter. So now you go from uh, a guy who wasn't the full-time starter to a backup. Um, And mind you, I think he played tremendous 
ball last year when he had his opportunity, uh, but it's different. Um, and now you are the man of the team. You are the leader. Um, so I, I believe he'll be successful. I just, you know, not sure yet because I haven't seen his body of work through, you know, a whole 12 game season. Um, I would say the positive is the defense. I think they've greatly improved and they understand the speed at which the offense plays now. So I believe with coaching and similar to playing, once you have the experience in it, you can only get better from it. And I saw some improvements last year as far as being able to make in-game adjustments because a couple years before that, uh, we weren't able to do that. Our offense was on the field and off the field so fast that our defense weren't able to make adjustments, and it showed because the teams were running the same exact plays. Um, now, you know, the coaches have the experience, so now they're able to, and they've been here for a few years, which is good, uh, which isn't a lot of turnover. They've been here for a few years. Now they understand, hey, our offense is going to be on the field for seven seconds. So we got to take five to make sure that we make an adjustment. And uh, with that, is going to be some success. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, seeing – seeing everything from this team. Like you said, the quarterback is the concern. You you want to see what he can do. Obviously, he's got some time under his belt, but now he is the guy, and there's always a transition into becoming the guy on the team. So the hope is that he'll come out firing and that Liberty and, and Maryland will be some good experience for Tommy DeVito as he heads in to the game against Clemson, and they can't look ahead. they got to stay focused. Final thing here, Will, uh, I mentioned that the team is ranked in the preseason top 25 in the AP and the coaches poll. I mentioned that they were picked to finish second behind only Clemson in the, in the Atlantic division. It's where I picked them. It's where the majority of the ACC media picked them as well. Typically, the majority of the ACC media is picking them 7-of-7 seven seven or 6-of-7 six in the Atlantic division from year to year over the past six years and, and so on. So what's your advice to the team because they were three and nine and then four and eight three years in a row. Nobody was afraid of them. Nobody thought anything about anything. When they beat Clemson, it was a giant fluke. And how the heck can they do it? And they, some people treated them like, like uh, you know, just a random team out there. Just, 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 you know, every squirrel gets a nut someday. Then they go 10 and three. Now they have report. Now they have respect. They got a bunch of players on preseason watch lists. This is a great opportunity for Syracuse to build on success. But what's your advice as a former player to a team that is now not sneaking up on anybody? They're ranked in the top 25 and they're picked to finish high in the ACC. And they have all these, you know, accolades and, and potential awards that could go to their players. What's your advice to them knowing that they're entering the season very differently than the past? Uh, just simple. Just remain humble. Um, all of the hype about preseason accolades are exactly that. They're preseason. Um, just, you know, again, just remain humble, man. Uh, nobody is going to give you anything because you played well a few years ago or last year. The teams that put you on their schedule are trying to do the exact same thing that you are, make it to the college football playoff. So if you don't remain humble and bring it every single week, you know, you're going to find yourself on the outside looking in. Yeah, absolutely. And so stay focused, stay humble, stay hungry. Coming from Will Hunter here today. Will, you know, I, I appreciate you being a part of the show. I love the fact that you told your story today. And I love that you're in central New York helping out the community. And, you know, and that you're a, a fellow business owner because, you know, I live that world every day. And as you know, it's it's not an, it's not an easy world to live, but it's, ex, it's, a, it's a, a extremely rewarding uh, humbling, <clears throat> just, you know, when you wake up every day and it's your name on the door, there's something to that that nothing else can give you. So with that being said, thank you for being a part of that and, and, and fighting the good fight and for everything you do for the community. And it would be my pleasure to have you back on the show very soon. Anytime. All right, well, take care and have a good day, okay? Thank you. You too.